Now, this is one um, that I'm sure, as I said earlier on the specific specific chart, is um, something that has raised the hackles, not just of indemnity insurance insurers, but also for all of you. And I'm sure it's like, I mean, you must have been devastated when you read about a medical professional um, being arrested for murder after um, and I assume at that stage it was still alleged negligence. So I'll be quickly going to go through, um, I'm not a criminal expert, but I do appear in um, the inquests, um, which is basically a criminal investigation in the magistrate's courts. And I also deal with um, the pathology reports, et cetera, that uh, sprouts from that. So I'll explain to you how we get there and how one deals with it and how you can find yourself in a situation like that. Um, my passion in life is to empower um, health and uh, medical professionals, and I don't want you ever to be scared if anything happens to you, um, as long as you've done your job properly, which I'm sure all of you have done. Uh, phone somebody, um, ask them to assist you, you're welcome to phone me at any time. Uh, find your indemnity insurer, and we will immediately assist you in um, explaining to you what's going to happen next and how to, how to deal with it. Um, we'd rather want you out there treating patients than being concerned about um, your life and um, liberty um, at any point in time. Okay, so to understand why you can get arrested for murder, um, and I'm sure those of you who followed the Oscar Pistorius trial um, and didn't uh, follow the sensation, but rather the law, would know a little bit more about this than those who didn't. Um, murder needs to be unlawful, in other words, any murders are lawful, so, but the definition says unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another. Now, what is very important um, about this is that there has to be intent and it has to be planned. Um, so I guess one can say that this is more like a Munchausen type of syndrome where um, somebody is like a serial killer, just to use a silly crime novel example, but you get the idea. Um, you plan to kill this patient, they irritate the crap out of you and you want to kill them. <laughs> so, and you plan it, you go get the medicine, you inject them and they dead. That's murder. So, so it's as simple as that. So you cannot be found guilty of murder if you didn't plan it and you didn't intend to do it. So those two aspects are very important. What becomes a little bit more complicated, and I've called it manslaughter, as we are all familiar with the word manslaughter, as I refer to it um, in US ITV programs. We've got a different word for it, but um, you get the idea. Manslaughter basically means that you didn't have the intent to harm, but there was the possibility, and you were aware of that possibility, and you didn't stop. So you had knowledge and you failed to act on that knowledge. And that could either be an act or an omission. And an omission is doing nothing. So you either did something or you didn't do something that you were supposed to do. This will also be what gets you in trouble in civil litigation. So negligence in civil litigation and manslaughter are very closely related. And that's why when it can, can become problematic, for instance, in an inquest, that you might find that there might be criminal liability because there was negligence. Um, negligence is based in civil litigation on the reasonable doctor, but more so nowadays on the reasonable patient. And in the UK, in particularly, the reasonable patient is um, the manner in which they judge cases. Nowadays, after um, a case, um, Lancashire Hospital, um, from about probably five, six years ago now, where the courts found that the reasonable doctor is no longer the basis for investigating a claim, but the reasonable patient. This becomes a lot more complicated because that means if your patient feels you were negligent, um, that is the basis on which your matter will be judged as opposed to you doing everything you were supposed to do and acting as a reasonable doctor. would. Now that reasonableness is not based, is based on the mores of society or as we call it contra bonus mores, which means it's against the mores of society. And that means that if any other doctor in your position with your experience and your circumstances would have been in the same position as you, would I have acted in the manner you did? So that I don't compare, for instance, a GP that's in a clinic that has to um, do an emergency C-section with an obstetrician that is in private healthcare with all possible facilities um, available to them. So, so it has to be a similar person. And that's why 
um, we saw that negligence in um, as, it, as it relates to the reasonable doctor is both subjective and object. The objective section is that person that has to be like you and subject, how did you react in that moment in time and what were your personal circumstances? Now, the duty of care, which I'm sure you all have heard about until um, you've got deaf and dumb, but the duty of care is also essential both in murder and negligence cases um, because it creates a legal liability. So that legal liability between you and the patient um, and your for failure to act responsibly as it's recognized by law um, to the intended beneficiary, which is the patient. And the first step in determining the existence of uh, a legally recognized responsibility is the content concept of an obligation or a duty. And that's your duty of care. In other words, the moment you accept that person as your patient, and you might be like, I recently um, had to defend a doctor that was doctor number 18 that came on, um, on day 27 of a 41 day hospitalization. Um, even if you are requested as a specialist to come and see a patient and you give your opinion there and then and you are no longer available or involved in the matter because it wasn't within your purview of speciality. In that moment that you were there and you gave an opinion, you have accepted that patient um, or that person as your patient. Um, so we have to be very careful um, not to not to rely too much on, oh, I wasn't really involved or there was another doctor um, that was, especially in trauma, um, the admissions doctor or the specialist that um, runs with the patient and reports back um, to the patient is often left to their own devices in reporting back, in corresponding and communicating with the patient and the patient family. People get upset about that. Some people want to hear from every single doctor that treats that passion. They want to hear um, in one that I recently had, they were upset with the dietitian, they were upset with the physiotherapist. Um, and so just make sure that everybody reports back, everybody gets proper consent, everybody introduces themselves, um, and you make sure then that your duty of care um, is taken care of. If you see that it's going patient, again, go to hospital management, go to your indemnity insurer and ask for a bioethical mediator to step in and assist, especially where there's a huge team of doctors involved um, or a very big family involved with a patient maybe that is mentally incapacitated and there's an argument as to what the treatment should be. Act or remission, as I um, touched on earlier on, uh, what could reason, when could it reasonably be expected that a person's actions or failure to act might cause injury to another person. Okay, the inquest, um, super horrible place. I don't know if I've in the meantime changed the court, but it was this, in Johannesburg, it's this dodgy little dingy court um, in um, Hillbrow. I think it was in the Hillbrow court or it was in the Jabak Magistrates court. And um, it was cold in winter. Even the poor magistrate had to wear a beanie and super hot in summer. And the place is small and everybody has to sit on top of they, um, themselves. But the important thing is, is that if you have an indemnity insurer, you are not going there alone. You will go and be going there with your advocate, with your attorney, and most likely with an expert as well. And maybe a few a sidekicks as well, a candidate attorney or however many people. So you will be surrounded by people that believe in you um, and that want to assist you. Um, and for that reason, I genuinely feel you shouldn't be scared. Um, I will tell you if I'm your advocate, if you need to start being scared. But for the most part, um, we are able to defend 99.9% .9 of claims adequately. And most of the time, as I said earlier on, if they are settled, they are settled for economic reasons. Um, you will, those of you who are in surgical teams would know that all anesthetic devs and invasive procedures um, require the, it being reported as an unnatural death. That means that it automatically goes to the, the uh, state pathologist um, to determine a cause of death. And the family can request for a private pathologist, but normally they are satisfied with the outcome of the site pathologist. Based on that inquest document, um, it is then determined if the matter should be referred for a hearing. Um, and to determine criminal intent, and that's when um, you will go to the inquest. Um, that genuinely does not happen often, but it does happen that um, matters proceed all the way to oral evidence in an inquest. 
a rest of a medical professional so sure, this is a tough tough thing and i honestly i don't think it should happen but i can see that it would happen and i cannot tell you that it would be unlawful if it does happen because the way our law is currently structured it is possible that you can get arrested not so much for murder you might be arrested for murder and it would lighted um, on the downgraded to manslaughter um but if there is that possibility, if there was negligence that um, and there was foreseeable harm, and I mean genuinely, from alignment's terms, every time you are cutting somebody's stomach open, for instance, to use a stupid example, you are causing harm. You are causing there's a scar, there's bleeding, that's harm. In terms of um, our assault laws in criminal, that's harm, even though you did it with their consent. So, so that is the difficulty that we currently have with our criminal laws, is that it's not adequately defined to deal with instances such as those. Of course, in trauma situations where you're saving a life, it's a completely different story. And yeah, that's my story. Wow, this one went quicker than I anticipated. I hope there's lots of questions. Again, there's all the Nawa's details. Um, if you want to ask them anything or ask me anything, uh, please feel free um, to call us.